let's start talking about second order differential equations that are constant coefficient and uh, homogeneous. There are, there are three types. In general, this is what I mean. I'm looking for something that looks like a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y equal to zero. Constant coefficient means that all these are numbers, not functions. And homogeneous means that this side is zero. Then uh, later on, you'll start removing these conditions. And the more conditions you have, uh, it's easier to solve. But uh, the first, we're going to drop the condition homogeneous, so we'll have some function here. That'll cause some headache. Uh, and then next, we're going to drop the constant coefficient, which means we will, we will uh, uh, make these as functions of x. Okay. That's going to make it even more complicated. Uh, all right, but let's try to, to talk about what to do here. Uh, in general, what you get is, uh, in, in such a case, when these are constants, and uh, you have 0 on the right side, in general, the ansatz, oh, I used the word ansatz. Oh, we had some uh, German-speaking people here, right? What does this mean, ansatz? No? Okay, maybe it's not German. Satz uh, means sentence. It's a, it's a, some type of sentence. So uh, uh, we, we talked about how instead of solving differential equations, we make guesses, right? But it's it's not a guess out. It's not a shot in the dark. It's a uh, it's an educated guess. So for each type of questions, we're going to start with some form of ansatz. It's like a pre-knowledge that, oh, if you have this kind of question, then we know that the answer looks something like this. Where uh, it's not the exact answer, but it, it, it gives us an idea of what to try in order to make the guess. So the ansatz in, in this case is that uh, the solution must look like e to the r times x. That's the answer. All right, so let's see. If we were to plug this into here, the second derivative, every time you differentiate, r comes down because of the chain rule, right? So derivative, one derivative is r times e r x. Second derivative is r squared e to the r x. So when you plug these in here, you get a times r squared e to the r x plus b times r times e to the r x plus c times e to the r x equal to 0. And then we can factor out to the e to the r x because that's a common factor. And then uh, looking at this equation, we say, well, exponential functions can never be 0. So the only way you can get a 0 is when this is equal to 0. So when you plug this ansatz in here, you end up with an equation that looks like this, ar squared plus br plus c equal to 0. Now, this calculation is same for any of these constant coefficient homogeneous equations. So it's, it's actually uh, kind of foolish to do this all the time. So in, in practice, what we're going to do is we will skip all this right, and just go from straight from this equation to this quadratic equation. Okay? This quadratic equation has the name characteristic equation. Uh, 
and the, the name comes from the fact that whether it has a uh, it has two solutions or uh, a, 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 a single solution with multiplicity <coughs> two or two complex solutions uh, depending on that uh, the behavior or, or the uh, the shape of the solution looks completely different. Okay. You're going to see that later. Okay. All right. So now let's think about the possibilities here. What's the solution here? The solution is uh, assuming that A is non-zero. If A is zero, then it says by prime plus cy. Then that's the first order of the equation. That's that's not interesting. You've already dealt with first order linear, so that's not interesting. Um, Okay, so assuming we have a non-zero, non this is a quadratic equation whose solution looks like a equals to negative b plus minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a, the quadratic formula. And depending on whether this is equal to zero or positive or negative, the, the solutions are different, right? So if this thing inside is positive, what do you know? In this, uh, if this is positive, what do you know? You know that R is? Huh? If you have something positive inside the square root, it's is that, number. huh? It's a real number. It's a real number. That's exactly right. Okay. If, if you have something positive inside the square root, that's a real number and you're adding some positive real number and subtracting that also, plus or minus. So you end up with two distinct real numbers. Oh, I should have added that uh, here, we're considering A, B, C to be all reals. So in this case, what we have is that uh, you have two distinct solutions, if we call them R1 and R2, then in general you can write down y as e to the R1x. Why e to the R1x? That's because we've taken our ansatz to be this one. No, this one. See, if I know the solution, now I can replace that, that R1 into this R and get, the, get one solution. Another solution will be e to the r2x. And then when you have more than one solution, actually it's a second order, so you would like to have two solutions, right? Then the remaining thing that you have to check is that uh, the Ronskian of this is non-zero, because if Ronskian is non-zero, you know what? What do you know if uh, Ronskian is non-zero? Yes? There's another solution out there something? No, no. You said if what is equal to zero? The Ronskian of these two, if it's not equal to zero, what do you know? They're linear independent. Linearly independent. They're completely different. So if you have completely linearly independent ones, then you can take C1 of one function and C2 of another function and create the entire solution. And it's actually true. You can check that if you have, if you have uh, e to the r1x, e to the r2x. How do you calculate the Ronskian again? Put those two functions. Write down their derivatives, right? So r1, e to the r1x, r2, e to the r2x. If you compute this, let's see, it's going to give you uh, e to the r1 times r2 and then R2 minus R1. Okay. So that, that's what, what you're going to get uh, when you compute the Ronskian of the two functions. And if R1 and R2 are different, this is never 0, this is non-zero. So you know that it's, uh, uh, they're, they're uh, linearly independent. If they're linearly independent, then this is good. <coughs> that's the general solution. Right? OK, so that's one case. Now, if b squared minus 4ac is negative, then what do you know? 
if this is negative, what do you know about r? Not a real number. It's not a real number. It's a complex number, right? Uh, so that will make r as some real plus minus imaginary. That's what it looks like, right? And of course, still you can you can write write the down the two solutions as e to the alpha plus beta i x c one plus c to e to the alpha minus beta i x c two like that. But this is not so desirable uh, the, for the reason being that. Uh, if x is a real number, this gives you complex value points, right? So often you want to handle real functions whose domain is real numbers and whose output is real values, okay? So and that, that's not good, okay? So instead of doing that, we use the following, uh, following identity. Uh, e to the ix is same as, what does the Euler identity say? Same as. What's the old guy? Hmm? <coughs> Cosine of x plus? Yes, correct. I sine x. So using this, if you have e to the <coughs> alpha plus beta i x, that can be written as e to the alpha x plus e to the beta x i. If you multiply x to both of them. And you can split this into two, e to the alpha x and e to the beta x i. And then you can further rewrite it as e to the alpha x cosine beta x plus i sine beta x because of this Euler identity here. Okay? I'm just applying, instead of putting x here, I'm putting beta x. So that's what we have. And then, uh, because of that, you can check that if you have e to the alpha plus beta i x plus e to the alpha minus beta i x, that's going to give you e to the alpha x Actually, if you divide this by 2, that's going to give you e to the alpha x cosine beta x. And then uh, if you take their difference, if you take e to the alpha plus beta i x minus e to the alpha minus beta i x, and you take half of it, you're going to get e to the alpha x sine beta x. Oh, e, one, one over 2i. So these two identities say, say the following. If you take this one and set c1 and c2 to be 1 half and 1 half, you create this solution. And if you take this one with c1 being 1 over 2i and 1 over 2i, uh, minus 1 over 2i, you create that solution. So we know that these two are solution of the original equation uh, because uh, for s some specific values of C1 and C2, these create these two. And uh, the, then you see that these two functions are real valued functions, where if x is real, right? So all we have to do now is to check whether they are linearly independent. Once again, check their Roskian. If it's non-zero, then we know that they are linearly independent. If they are linearly independent, then you can plug them in, uh, uh, put, put the, uh, the, take their linear combinations, and that's the solution. Okay? So all this discussion leads to the following, following uh, conclusion. Sorry, it's a little messy. Let me just erase everything because uh, it's all the it was just a discussion. 
which leads to the following conclusion, which is that... Uh, Wait, so all that doesn't mean anything, right? I mean, if you didn't understand anything I said, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> if you understood it, then it means a lot. All right, uh, so you have... Uh, you can say uh, the solutions look like e to the alpha x c1 cosine beta beta x plus c2 sine beta x. It comes, still comes from this answers because of that complicated argument that I presented. And you can still sh see that this is, uh, if you expand this out, it's, it's definitely linear combinations of the two functions I showed you. And those two functions are linearly independent, so we know that this generates all the solutions. That's what I have. Now the problem <coughs> really happens when b squared minus 4ac is 0. What's the problem that you get in this case? What happens to R in this case? Hmm? Less than zero. No, no, if B squared minus 4AC is equal to zero, what can you say about R? Undefined. No. What square root of zero? Is that undefined? <coughs> square root of zero is zero. Yeah. So you only have one solution. You have only one solution, thank you. Okay. If b squared minus 4ac is equal to 0, then this is 0, and therefore you have just a single solution, negative b over 2a. This is a single solution. Okay. Uh, only one solution. OK, so, so what? Why does this cause a headache? <coughs> They're linearly dependent. Well, okay, so that's a roundabout way to say say it. Can can anyone else uh, uh, say something else? Yes, yes. It's a second order, and there's only one solution. Yeah, actually, that's the problem. Second order requires two linearly independent solutions, so that we can take linear combinations. I mean the. the the, the uniqueness theorem in mathematics tells us that we need two free, free parameters, C1 and C2. We can only have two free parameters when we have two linearly independent solutions. That only then we can say C1 times the first function plus C2 times the second function. But if we have only one value, we don't have the second function to play with. In other words, uh, there's no other function to test the raw scheme with. That would be bad, right? So that, that's, that's where your, your comment fits in, okay? All right, uh, so we have to come up with some other solution. And uh, thankfully, somebody figured out and that in this case, it's always the case that uh, if e to the r1 x is a solution and r1 has multiplicity 2, then the second solution is just x times e to the r1 x. Okay, so that that's always true. If if it has multiplicity two, then the second solution can always be obtained by doing this. Okay, and how do you know? Well, you, you can just check. Okay, so in the case when b squared minus four a c is equal to zero, you can plug this into the, the equation uh, equation here. Take this one and plug it in, and you can check that it does satisfy the equation. All right. Uh, so, so what remains for us to, is to check what? Whether these two functions are linearly independent. Okay. Go to the Ronskian, <coughs> calculate the Ronskian, check that, they are, that it's not zero. Um, and once you check that it's not zero, then we can happily say y is equal to c1 times the first function plus c2 times the second function. Okay. So you basically have three different types of solution depending on the solution of this characteristic equation. Okay? So that, that's the intro. Uh, 